Hey mushroom fans, it's Anna McHugh. I have a uh, really nice pair of uh, sort of rosy reddish Russula mushrooms. And uh, in times past, I probably would have called this uh, ro uh, Russula rosea or the rosy Russula mushroom. I will not dare or deign to do that today, reason being that I've been advised that there are so many Russula mushrooms, so many of them are unnamed and very, very difficult to distinguish, that I'm better off saying this is a uh, sort of pinky red Russula mushroom. It looks a little bit like, uh, you know, something you would give someone for Valentine's Day with a nice pinky blush on the stem and uh, a little bit of stripey striation. So if I wanted to describe it, that's how I would do so. I wouldn't be able to say this is Russula rosea or even Russula rosea group, which is oftentimes my colleges for like, we have a thing, we thought it was one thing, now it's six things. So you can kind of expand the definition of uh, a species by adding group to the end. It's not really a cheat, but suffice it to say, Russulas are so very diverse and there are so very many of them that I can't even really get away with that uh, in a comfortable way. So uh, I've already covered identification of Russula mushrooms on this channel before, but I will cover it really briefly. This is one of the most common uh, genus, uh, you know, and, and sort of fruiting body types you will see. The uh, Russula genus, there's about 750 species. That is a guess. Uh, many, many, many of them are unnamed. We probably don't have anywhere near 750 species in North America, but probably a couple of hundred. And so, uh, and when I say probably, again, it's because mycology is constantly uh, defining, delineating, and, and splitting, uh, you know, existing species concepts into new ones. So, uh, but as far as identification, even though it's impossible, or not impossible, but very, very unlikely you will be comfortable uh, with a genus and species identification on a Russula, you can recognize them pretty easily, especially once you see them a few times. So you have a cap and stem dealy, uh, they have white gills, common names uh, oftentimes are uh, brittle gill. I didn't even bother with that. Russula was probably the first, uh, you know, mushroom Latin word I started using because at the point at which I'm spitting out brittle gill and Russula is shorter and there are so many of them, so I'm constantly discussing them, I just sort of adopted that. So, you know, you will see um, this, that, and the other brittle gill in uh, uh, various literature, but I just call them Russulas. So, uh, you know, cap and stem thing, but because they're called brittle gills, uh, that's a good uh, sort of indication of why and how they get their common name. So they are very uh, brittle and they come apart very, very easily when you uh, damage them. And this makes them delightful for things like mushroom fights. They have a really good, you know, um, explode when you hit something or someone with them. I uh, recently uh, found out that a friend of mine actually does mushroom or um, does Russell a cornhole games. And I think that is a delightful idea because even if you miss, you're going to see a mushroom explode. So there's some drama whether or not, uh, you know, you are successful with your throw. So, uh, you know, brittle and uh, in this case actually is a very common feature, you know, sometimes uh, or not sometimes, but almost always uh, people will refer to the uh, stems of Russula mushrooms is snapping open like a piece of chalk. That is absolutely true, but in a lot of cases, unless you're there and the mushroom is super duper fresh, uh, you'll have worms and bugs get to it. So, you know, you can see it's kind of like that same sort of uh, brittle tissue, but it's been hollowed out on the inside. Uh, Russulas are generally edible. Uh, some of them are good, uh, and I'm specifically referring to cracking green Russulas. So Russulas oftentimes come in uh, purple and red, and you know a lot of times they have white stems and there's little red dealy, and they're very spicy and unpalatable. So those are not counted as edible. But you also have uh, cracking green Russulas. So you know you have. Um, Russula parvovirescens, which is sort of this beautiful blue-green mushroom I haven't found this year, so I feel very sorry for myself, but it's got this lovely sort of quilted cracking color on, t uh, you know, pattern on top. And then a related species group called uh, Russula crustosa. It comes from uh, the, you know, cracking appearance on the top. It's kind of crusty looking. It is not a crusty mushroom, thank goodness. Both of those are really good from an edibility perspective. Uh, side note, I always pause on Russula crustosa because I made a very common Latin 
uh, learning mistake uh, when I learned Russula Crestosa for the first time. So because I don't have Latin and I don't have Greek, um, you know, a lot of the uh, Latin learning that I do is uh, sort of associating one word with another. And so, you know, in the case of, say, for instance, Oreo Boletus betula, which is a beautiful uh, bolete type mushroom and edible that I really like, it's uh, Oreo Boletus is A-U-R-A, -A, so it's for gold. And I can remember that because of my periodic table. So I sort of tie these things together. Uh, however, with Russula crustosa group, for whatever reason, I thought it was Russula crostata group. And so I was like, it looks like toast on top and it's nice. It has this cracking thing. Perfect sense. Of course, as soon as I roll this out uh, on the forums, I got uh, a very well-deserved correction and, uh, you know, um, many laughs were had by all. Suffice it to say, cracking green russulas and cracking, uh, you know, crustosa comes in green, but it's also sometimes like grayish, sometimes purplish. So, uh, but those are sort of an area of russulas. If you're interested in eating them, that's where you should go. Um, you know, in the case of russulas that are similar to the ones that I found, which are, you know, again, purple and red, oftentimes with a white stem, but in this case with a nice rosy blushed stem, um, you know, many of them are edible if they are, uh, you know, palatable. And so when I say palatable, what I mean is uh, if it doesn't taste like cayenne pepper and light your mouth up and be very unpleasant, then you can take it home and eat it if you want to. I typically don't eat russulas very often unless they're the parvovirescens or crustosa group uh, just because they don't have a lot of flavor they're kind of unremarkable and also i am a very vigorous cook i like to stir things and flip things and be very like engaged with my food and russulas simply won't tolerate that they'll just they'll just fall apart in the pan not that there's anything specifically wrong with that so um, as far as the relationships and where you'll find Russell and mushrooms, I've totally destroyed them at this point. Uh, so you're just going to have to put up with a, a talking head for a minute. So uh, Russell and mushrooms are mycorrhizal and uh, the mycorrhizal lifestyle is one of the more common lifestyles and ways that fungi feed themselves. So when you see mushrooms on the forest floor, oftentimes they're, uh, you know, parasitic or decomposing. So, you know, you'll see mushrooms like honey mushrooms growing on wounded trees um, that, you know, eventually will be choked and killed by the fungus. Uh, and then you'll see, you know, things like oyster mushrooms that are kind of doing their own thing in between. They'll attack trees or they'll decompose things. But a lot of the mushrooms you find on the forest floor, including russulas, are mycorrhizal. And uh, mycorrhizal is, I'll, I'll break down the, uh, you know, scientific term here. Myco is, um, it's actually a Greek root for fungus. And then rhizal uh, refers to the root. So rhizy is, uh, you know, the, the word for root. And so mycorrhizal just means root fungus. And so a lot of mushrooms you see on the forest floor are actually growing in partnership with a tree or a plant. And uh, this partnership is mutually beneficial. So uh, essentially what you have is a, uh, you know, a fungus that cannot produce its own uh, food getting photosynthetic and tree and plant sugars from its plant or tree partner. In exchange, the mycelium, the, uh, you know, fine fungal network of cells uh, that, you know, constitutes the true fungal body that grows around and sort of encases the root system of its plant or tree partner. And the mycelium is constantly absorbing a lot of moisture from the ground. It stretches much further than a root system typically does. And so it delivers a lot of moisture directly to its plant or tree partner. And so, you know, in a lot of uh, research, the, the, you know, relationships between these organisms is very important for the health of the plants as well as, of course, the mushrooms. So, uh, you know, you have this sort of mutually beneficial thing going on. In addition to just like straight up moisture, the mycelium is delivering by way of that moisture important other nutrients that are in the soil. So you have, um, you know, minerals, etc., things that are in the water that it's taking to the tree. So that is, um, I guess, the, the first major benefit of having a mycorrhizal partner if you're a tree. Uh, the second thing is that mycelium can convey some sort of, uh, you know, um, enhanced defense for that root system. So mycelium is very, very vulnerable to attack. It's very permeable. And so, you know, fungi are extraordinarily, um, you know, uh, vulnerable to one another. So fungi attacking other fungi happens all the time and it is uh, a battle to the death. So you have 
fungi, they exude a lot of their uh, sort of defensive chemicals. So you have antifungal compounds, you have antibacterial compounds as well. Super cool because of course now we have antibiotics as a result. So, uh, you know, the, the mushroom will produce these, uh, you know, antibacterial compounds. Uh, oyster mushrooms do an awesome thing where they have this yellow exudate uh, that paralyzes nematodes and other microscopic uh, bugs. And then the fungus will proceed to consume uh, that, that paralyzed little, uh, you know, bug or insect, which I think is terrifying and cool in all of the right ways. So, you know, fungi are pumping all of these chemical compounds out and suffice it to say, that is uh, oftentimes very beneficial to the tree or plant partner because you have sort of this, you know, defensive, uh, additional defensive layer uh, by an organism that is really, really vulnerable to attack and always trying to, uh, you know, keep its environment as tidy of competitors as possible. So in the case of mushrooms like Russula's, that is what is called an ectomycorrhizal relationship. And ectomycorrhizal simply means that uh, the fungus does not permeate the root system. It grows on top of and encases the root system. So, um, you know, that is a, a differentiation between the different kinds of mycorrhizal relationships. So the mushrooms you see are, um, you know, for the most part, I'm not aware of endomycorrhizal mushrooms, but, you know, it's, it's, it is a more, um, like, attached and casual relationship. And, you know, you can see other people as well because, you know, mushrooms will partner and buddy up with all kinds of things. You have, uh, you know, I guess you'd call them a thripple of a tree and uh, a mushroom and a mushroom living with, uh, a, you know, an Indian, or excuse me, a ghost pipe or, uh, you know, a, um, gosh, mycoheterotroph, which basically is a plant that attacks a mushroom. And that mushroom is usually having a myco, you know, ectomycorrhizal relationship with a tree. So you have all of this crazy stuff going on. So that's a mycorrhizal relationship. Not to say it's superficial because it certainly isn't. But then you have uh, um, endomycorrhizal fungi. And these are fungi oftentimes that are, um, we know less about them a lot. If you wanna learn more about them, more than likely your sources are going to be plant pathology research. These are uh, fungi that grow between the cell walls of their plant partners. I don't know very much about them, um, you know, and the, the relationships and their benefits and what happens is, is a little, you know, uh, cryptic to me. One of the things that I have read about, however, is that uh, there are some ecto uh, micro, excuse me, endo mycorrhizal uh, fungi that can help with, um, you know, drought tolerance and, and similar things. So, um, you know, long and short, oftentimes if you see a mushroom on the forest floor and it is, you know, not growing on a piece of wood, there's a really good chance it's one of two things. It is a decomposer that goes after, um, you know, advanced, uh, like pretty well decomposed fun uh, uh, compost. So, you know, you have agaricus mushrooms. Those are the ones you also buy in the store that like to grow on poop. Uh, you have, you know, your oyster mushrooms that are growing on wood. And then you have mushrooms that are growing on the forest floor that are not decomposing anything because they are in this, uh, you know, delicate and uh, oftentimes very long-standing relationship with their tree and uh, or plant uh, partner. So rosy-ish red Russula mushrooms, 750, uh, you know, Russula mushrooms total. I'm just going to leave it at a color. It has striations and it has the only thing that really is, I think, uh, distinctive about the specimen that I found is that rosy blush. That's not super uncommon, but it's a little uncommon because usually, usually Russulas have a um, like bright uh, sort of, you know, linen, uh, like clean linens white uh, sort of, of stem. So, uh, you know, you'll find them under pine almost any time of year. That's the one other thing is you can satisfy your mushroom itch almost any time of year uh, with these lovely uh, mycorrhizal buddies that uh, live with our pine trees and other plants.